Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Higher Right today for our first webinar of the year. Um, we are presenting today our annual drug and health screening State of the Union. Um, I'm Katie Brito. I'm with Higher Right, and I am a, the director of products for our drug and health screening business, and I am going to be your host today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go through a couple uh, quick things. First, Highrate prepared this presentation for informational purposes only, and this is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. If you do have any questions or legal questions, please reach out to your in-house legal counsel. And then just a few housekeeping items um, in working in this system. Um, we are not going to be providing copies of today's slides, but we will be sending out an email tomorrow with the SHRM credits and the HRCI credits and a link to the recorded session that you can listen to or pass on to your colleagues. Um, and then if you are experiencing any, au any audio or visual issues um, today, please just refresh your browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard, or you can let us know through that Q&A widget at the very bottom of your screen. You can also use that to ask questions today as well, and we'll try to answer some of those at the end or after today's meeting. Um, after the presentation, we're also going to be sending out, um, uh, or you'll, you'll see a, a link to a short survey. Um, please, if you would, let us know what you thought of today's presentation and provide us any um, ideas for future topics. That's always very helpful. Without further ado, I will introduce you today's one, to today's wonderful speaker, Dr. Todd Simo. Dr. Simo is Higher Rates Chief Medical Officer and our Managing Director of Transportation. If you would like to view his bio, you can do so in the speaker folder at the bottom. I'm going to turn it over to him now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Katie, for that introduction. And I really want to thank everyone who, who joins this. This is traditionally, and it remains this year, Higher Rates highest attended webinar. So it's certainly you know, my pleasure to, to present this information to you and, and really want to thank you, um, you know, for joining today and, and spending this hour with me. So again, just like other years, I kind of use the State of the Union <laughs> address just to say we, we manage millions of drug screening specimens per year. Um, you know, we can provide some trends overall of what we see. So it really goes through, you know, what's happening in the arena from a positive rate perspective. So I am going to be talking about a lot about you know, lab positive rates and how those compare to MRO verified positive rates. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, you know the people at Quest, Dr. Barry Sample, and, and his colleagues at Quest for you know uh, for, or for propagating their drug testing index. So many of the slides will reference uh, data from Quest. The other group of slides will reference data specifically from from Higher Right. So after looking at the yearly trends, I am going to talk about you know, marijuana trends. And probably more specific now, it's Delta 9 THC. So you know, as I kind of walk through this presentation, you'll see a lot of what I talk about will be Delta 9 you know, THC and not marijuana, because that's really the marker that is used in the drug screening industry to identify you know, cannabis use. There will be a DOT update, you know, on alternate specimens. And then really, you know, close it out with return on investment uh, information, uh, as well as the five most important things to consider. So let's go into the kind of data heavy part of this presentation. So when you look at you know laboratory positive rates, and you can see what's in blue here is from Quest Diagnostics Drug Screening Index for 2022. So this is really lab positive rate rate data from 2021, and you can see you know the comparisons between federally mandated urine that has the lowest lab positive rate of 2.2 percent, and then you can see it it. You know, more than doubles when you look at the general workforce urine positive rate. And you can see another step up in regards to oral fluid. And then again, once again, almost a doubling when you look at the lab positive rate for hair. So, you know, when we look at these three specimens, urine essentially detects drug use within the last week. 
So even if you are an obese, heavy smoker uh, of THC, the typical person will clear that within one week, and it's only very few that persist longer than that. And then nearly every drug has a detection window, you know, of a week with the exception of amphetamines, methamphetamine, cocaine, their detection windows two to three days. Uh, oral fluid, on the other hand, for THC has a detection window of less than 24 hours. And, you know, for other stimulant and other drugs, it's generally a two to three day uh, window of detection. And then you can see the specimen with the highest lab positive right here has at minimum, about a 30-day detection window if you only have a half a half an inch of hair. If the collector is able to collect, you know, one and a half inches of hair, you you end up having a 90-day, you know, kind of detection window. Um, and, and that's just based on length of hair. For every half of an inch of hair, you essentially have a 30-day a window. Now, typically, I'll, I'll compare the lab positive rate to the you know National Survey of Drug Use and Health, um, and that's propagated. The last one uh, that was propagated prior to this presentation was in January 2022, and there's a, about a 13 month latency there. So that that given survey uh, was self-reported drug use in the year two, 2020. And you can see that self-reported drug use rate in 2020 was 12.6 percent. At the time that I created these slides, they didn't propagate the January 2023 data as of yet. I haven't checked for that, you know, that yet. But you know, if there is interest for me to, you know, run through another presentation uh, later on this year to really, you know, compare lab positive rates, MRO positive rates to what people are saying they're using, you know, more than happy to have that presentation. But you can see just from a trending perspective, you know, urine doesn't keep up with the self, you know, self-reported use. Oral fluid is closer. Hair is even closer to that. And we'll actually give some reasons why there has been a fall off in the amount of positives um, you know, shown at the lab, you know, for in oral fluid in later slides. So now continuing just to look at, um, you know, federally mandated urine program, uh, and this again, it's from Quest Diagnostics. You can see that the positive rate, you know, pre-employment, the lab positive rate, so this doesn't mean MRO verified positive rate. It just says, hey, it went out as a confirmed positive at the lab was 2.3%. You can see that the random rate is, is less, and that's always a good thing. We'd like to see the random rates you know, being less than the pre-employment rate, uh, particularly in MRO verified results. And you can see that the post-accident rate actually jumps up and is almost double that of the pre-employment rate, showing that, you know, drugs and illicit, you know, uh, drugs do cause, you know, increased accidents. So, you know, those people you know, get an accident, the predominant agency for DOT and predominant agency for post-accident rates in the DOT program is, you know, Federal Motor Carrier uh, Safety Administration and to, you know, so to speak, mandate a post-accident test for a truck driver. You know, if there's a fatality, there's automatically a drug screen and alcohol test. If there's not a fatality, but it's a FMCSA reportable accident, meaning tow away of one or more vehicles, significant injury requiring off-site treatment, plus the driver, the commercial driver needs to be cited for a violation. So, you know, that citation. So it's not only an accident, but the driver do, was doing something wrong. And you can see that that rate, you know, bumps up the, to four, you know, 4.4%. When you bucket, you know, what you know, DOT, federally mandated donors are positive for from the lab, you can see that when you combined, you know, amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, and ecstasy, and ecstasy is a very, very, very small part of that, you can see that stimulants are actually the predominant positive class and not THC. And you can then see the uh, drop off with the opioids, opiate, opiates, which in the DOT panel include oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, 
you know, morphine, uh, codeine, and heroin metabolite. And then surprising to say here, you know, under 1%, but still 1%, you know, almost a half a percent of the, you know, DOT positive was PCP. So it was angel dust. It was always thought from a lab perspective that the only reason they got angel dust in the federal program is because third-party administrators used to have to send known positives to, so to speak, QA the lab. Well, in 2018, believe, I believe that re- requirement went away. So no one's sending the lab spiked positives for uh, PCP anymore. And this is, you know, fairly telling that, you know, PCP is still a substance out there that unfortunately people are gravitating to. Again, far less of an impact than others, but still out there and a profoundly bad drug to be on. And now looking at the clearinghouse data, so the FMCSA has created a clearinghouse. It's been in place since January 6, 2020. They record violations per year um, for different reasons, such as actual knowledge of drug use, a drug test refusal, a drug test MRO verify positive. And you can see each year from 2020 through 21 into 22, that the amount of positive results being reported into the clearinghouse during that calendar year has been increasing. You know, really a, a not a good trend, you know, for the motor carrier industry that, you know, unfortunately the clearinghouse doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, deterring as much as, as it was hoped. Now, some of this increase is there's several small carriers that didn't participate in 2020 that then participated in 21 or 22. But again, the overall trend is concerning. Of the drug violations, again, the majority of them are captured, you know, in as a pre-employment test at about 55%. And the other 45% are a current employee. So the current employee MRO verified positive rate is concerning. Um, because it's not vastly lower than the pre-employment rate. It is lower, but not vastly lower. And you can see that, you know, the numbers here from Quest where stimulants were the the number one drug detected, class of drugs detected, you can see that that fell to number two. Marijuana, or excuse me, you know, Delta 9 THC was the number one MRO violation. But again, it was number one, but not by leaps and bounds greater than the stimulant class. And you can see a relative drop off um, for for the rest of them in regards to what was reported into the clearinghouse. And again, the stimulant that gets overturned on a routine basis is amphetamine. So amphetamine, there's prescription medications like Adderall, Vyvanse, there's a variety of other, Dexedrin, you know, and around looking at higher right data, around 90% of uh, amphetamine-only positive results is overturned on MRO review. So that really shows that that number, you know, goes from being, you know, a very, you know, more significant from a lab positive rate compared to an MRO verified positive rate. So now I'm looking at Quest data, and this is for non-regulated, so general workforce urine testing. And you can see the pre-employment positive rate was 5.4%. You can see clients that have a random uh, urine program has the same or a bit higher positive rate in their random program. And once again, post-accident tests, so someone had an injury or accident, in many causes, there was also concern of impairment. You can see that that rate is almost double the other categories. And from what they're become, you know, being tested positive for, you can clearly see that, that marijuana, you know, by far is the highest, more than double that of the next class, which is the stimulants, you know, amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, and, and ecstasy. Then it drops down to, you know, a you know, close third, you know, from second to third to, you know, narcotics. And narcotics here are the opioids, the opiates, as well as methadone. 
The difference in the two categories, you can see that there are in the non-regulated uh, programs, companies can extend those panels to include drugs like benzodiazepines and barbiturates. So you can see that the B and B, which is benzodiazepine and barbiturates, has about an 8% lab positive rate. PCP goes down and uh, you know in percentage wise. And that's really because of the amount of other things that can be tested for in a non-regulated program dilutes that number down some. I believe the significance, whether it's DOT or non-DOT with PCP, is essentially the same. So now let's look at oral fluid. So oral fluid, you can see from a pre-employment perspective, has a 7% positive rate. It does drop, so clients that are running an oral fluid random program, you know, does see a drop in, in the amount of positives, or at least lab positives, to 5.5%. And again, the number one spike here, as, as people would expect, would be uh, post-accident. And then, you know, when you look at the right-hand part of this, you know, what's, what's concerning here is, you know, Delta 9-THC is the number one by far analyte detected in oral fluid. Oral fluid with its detection window for most, most drugs of two to three days and with marijuana less than 24 hours, what oral fluid is doing is looking at what people are generally doing on a daily basis. And what you're seeing here is, you know, of those oral fluid tests, you know, 94% of the Quest laboratory can confirm positives, confirm positives for Delta 9 THC. So that, that's showing, you know, relatively the amount of, so to speak, you know, daily drug use that is happening out in the United States. Hair test positive rate. So from a, you know, hair testing perspective, no one is doing post-accident hair testing uh, just due to the window of detection not being appropriate for that. You know, when you use a drug, it takes about nine to 10 days for it to even appear in the hair. So therefore, no one does it post-accident because it has no temporal relationship to, you know, recent drug use um, as defined of use within that last day. So you can see the pre-employment rate is, is 10% or just over 10%. And the random rate, so there are clients that have, do random hair, and you can see that the random rate is higher. Again, a concerning trend. Uh, you know, people, you know, pre-employment, you know, based upon this, are using less drugs prior to that pre-employment test, i.e., hey, I know I'm going for this test, I'm going to stop using drugs, cut back my hair, do something to try to, you know, uh, mitigate that initial test, and then they when they read you know join an employment arena may go back to drug use that's what the data suggests and again hair from a laboratory testing perspective is is a magnet for stimulants stimulants are water uh, soluble so things like methamphetamine and cocaine readily go into hair and are are detected there marijuana is much harder to get in the hair you generally need to be a a daily smoker to have a big enough THC burden for it to appear in your hair. But even with that, you know, the majority of laboratory positives at Quest still are THC with a very close second being the stimulant class. So this is, you know, the last time the National Survey of Drug Use and Health was propagated, so 2020. So I really grabbed the slide from last year's presentation to essentially show you that, you know, the, the positive rate, the self-reported positive rate in the group of people 26 years old and greater, so the people that are in the kind of prime of their working life or working career, um, you can see that each year it's stepped up by at least a point uh, from 2018, 2019, to 2020. I would expect in 2021 there will be another increase in self-reported drug use uh, with the propagation of, you know, further, you know, decriminalized marijuana laws. Um, yeah, and that survey does put marijuana as one of the drugs of abuse still. So from that perspective, it is march marching up. But you can see from the Quest data, you know, the you know, combined 
urine positive rates. So looking at you know both DOT and non-DOT, putting them together, that has been flat over that period of time at around 4.5%. You can clearly see that oral fluid and hair has kept up with that and has appropriately increased based upon self-reported drug use increasing. So again, I'm a huge advocate of alternate specimen testing. You know, I've, been, I've said it before that urine is a test that you can study for. There are a variety of ways that you can prepare yourself for that urine test, you know, whether it's, you know, buying synthetic urine, uh, getting, you know, natural diuretics or other things or adulterants which you put into the sample that are very sophisticated and don't appear within the sample once it arrives to the lab. So there's all sorts of things to sort of seek study for that test. And I believe the urine positive rate, lab positive rate, is truncated due, due to people knowing how to prepare for that given test, whereas oral fluid and hair are much more difficult to, so to speak, subvert and, and study for. So now I'm, you know, going to, you know, toggle over, and this is really higher right data now, and it's really our transactional volume by, by specimen. So when I did a uh, snapshot of 2021, you know, you can read the numbers here, 93% plus, you know, did urine, 6% plus did uh, oral fluid, just under 1%, you know, did hair. Um, and then when you all of a sudden look at the, the next group, you can see that the amount of people doing oral fluid and hair reduced from 2021 to 2022. A lot of factors are involved in that. Um, coming out of the pandemic, there's been more remote workforce uh, oral fluid testing, you know, has less less of a laboratory collection network. That collection network is increasing based upon DOT going to approve it. Um, so that is increasing, but right now the collection network is still much smaller. So when you go to a remote workforce, people working from home and not coming into offices or not coming into a central location, you know, using urine just is logistically easier. Um, also, you know, with the current employment environment, of uh, you know the you know candidates are less likely to go to employers that hair test. Part of that is the candidate experience. There's people out there that don't want their hair touched. You know, they spend a lot of time, energy, you know, uh, getting their hair the way they want it. So to have someone all of a sudden cut hair for a drug test is not palatable. So there are some employers that were traditional hair testing employers that stopped hair testing, and it was really due to a candidate um, experience perspective and them wanting to broaden out their candidate pool due to the uh, very tight hiring environment. But that's really what we're looking at. So, again, we, we haven't seen a departure about the same amount of clients from 2021 to 2022 are drug screening. In fact, there's a relative increase in our data of the amount of consumers. However, that increase is just winning more business and not new people adopting it. So I'd say the growth is flat, um, you know, from a, you know, new people drug screening perspective. But there has been a slight migration, you know, from oral fluid and hair, you know, to urine, due to the reasons I uh, presented previously. You know, and again, high right utilization here, you can see the same thing, and I apologize, that the last utilization was at a Quest level. This is the higher right utilization perspective. The Quest levels actually add up to 100%. The higher right utilizations actually don't. And it's because many of our clients, um, you know, will have a urine program and an oral fluid program or a urine program and a hair program. So there's a lot of, uh, so to speak, um, you know, uh, crossover. But from a transactional volume perspective, our transactional volume looks very much like Quest that we did see, you know, over a you know 30% decrease in utilization of, you know, of oral fluid and hair specimens. Um, more markedly noted in hair specimens than oral fluid. 
uh, you know, for those previously mentioned reasons, remote workforce, um, you know, candidate experience. So again, the same things that I presented on the last slide are really illustrated once again here that, you know, our clients have, you know, migrated a bit away from alternate specimens toward urine for those candidate uh, factors and for that remote workforce uh, being more of a norm in 2022 than it was prior. So here's the higher right MRO verified positive rate data. So this is for all urine specimens, whether it's DOT or non-DOT. That's the way I've always aggregated the data, so I didn't want to tease it out. I do have a slide coming up that shows the difference between regulated and non-regulated. Uh, you show our oral fluid positive rate. Uh, and again, this is MRO verified, so these are not laboratory positive. These are MRO verified positive. And again, here. So, you know, with the lab positive rate essentially being flat year over year, urine MRO verified positive rate remains flat from a higher rate perspective. We're just over 2% of our urine specimens are verified positive by the MRO team. You can see oral fluid kind of shows this different story. So you can see there was a high water mark in 2018 of 7.5%. And then it's kind of went down year over year. And when I teased into this data, a predominant reason it went down year over year from 7.5% down to a, a low water mark of just under 4% was the migration of clients, especially large clients, from testing THC and oral fluid. As you saw, you know, well over 80% of, of lab confirmed positives in oral fluid are THC. Um, and as people moved away from THC testing, the MRO verified rate continued to fall. But here's the concerning part. There was a two point jump that went from four to six in 2022, despite you know, about a third of the oral fluid specimens no longer having THC as part of the panel. So the positive rate was increasing and that po positive rate primarily increased due to more cocaine and more methamphetamine use in that population. So again, it didn't continue to go down, it didn't flatten, it bumped up. So it'll be interesting to see over this year what happens with the oral fluid data. I'm really interested in the oral fluid data because oral fluid is the window of what people are doing the day of the collection or within that day of collection. So again, it, it's very powerful and temporarily related to that drug use to really to see what people are doing. Here on the other hand, really stayed around 6% for four years. We did have a market decrease in the amount of people hair testing, but our clients who hair tested saw, you know, on average, 9.5% of their specimens being MRO verified positive. So a big, you know, return on investment number there in regards to hair tests. When you all of a sudden compare that to the last data we have from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, you can see that, you know, the self-admitted drug use rate of 12.5%, you know, was up, you know, it was up here. So again, the MRO positive rate uh, for hair jumped, you know, continued to, you know, show trending and urine completely showed no trending to that number. So now let's just look at DOT urine versus non-regulated urine with, you know, higher rate MRO verified positives. So the non-regulated urine was at 2.5%. The DOT urine was at 2.1%, so it truncated that number down to 2.2% in 2022. I did put oral fluid on here. Oral fluid, you know, will be approved and, and in all likelihood, I would believe would be improved here for DOT use in 2023. And just for the DOT employers on there, you know, this 5.9% is a bit lower than the panel that you may see. And I'll have data on that but further showing that it's, that's closer to 8% when you test it for TH, with THC. But you can clearly see from a non-regulated perspective, you know, more than a doubling 
of the MRO verified positive rate urine compared to oral fluid. So for the DOT employers, when this becomes available, if you're looking at how do you utilize this, I would just say be prepared to have a higher positive rate. So here's oral fluid positive rate panel comparison. And really what I did is compared it, you know, which ones have THC in them over the year and which ones didn't have THC in them. So, you know, two thirds or just over two thirds of our samples of oral fluid had THC in them with an MRO verified positive rate of 7.9%. When we just look at the panels without THC, it was, you know, again, again, just under a third. And the positive rate was, you know, just over half of that that was in uh, for the ones with THC. So you're looking for something that, uh, again, less positive. However, the MRO verified positives here are predominantly, you know, benzo, or excuse me, benzyl econine, which is the metabolite of cocaine, and uh, methamphetamine. So again, somewhat concerning and also you know matching apples to apples 2018 very 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 few clients well under one percent didn't have thc in their panel that had a 7.5 percent positive rate and now the positive rate with thc went up by a half a point so here's marijuana and screening programs and again, when I go through this, I'll really be talking about Delta 9 THC because that's the marker of marijuana or ca a cannab a, you know, cannabis, excuse me. It's the predominant, you know, uh, cannabinoid that accounts for, you know, intoxication and impairment. And again, unlike alcohol, marijuana is different. Uh, marijuana is vastly different because marijuana's, so to speak, impairment uh, is not related to a blood level. Alcohol's impairment is directly related to a blood level. The higher your blood level goes in alcohol, the more uh, impaired you are. Marijuana, on the other hand, it isn't like that. Certainly, marijuana has a window uh, that is intoxicating, which means the person feels high. Um, and that, depending on what you use and how much you use, lasts anywhere from three to six hours. You know, and marijuana or THC intoxication is vastly different than alcohol or other stimulants. Alcohol and other stimulants tend to cause really erratic behavior, um, you know, a false sense of power, you know, running through red lights, speeding out of control, where, you know, marijuana or THC, you know, really causes this different type of impairment, causes, you know, so to speak, you know, erratic activity, but it's erratic activity, which seems to be slower. You know, these are the people that are driving up to an intersection and slowing down and stopping at the intersection before proceeding. They're the people who stop at green lights. They're the people that are on a, you know, on ramp to the expressway that, you know, essentially can't see any headlights coming around before they proceed. So, again, they do cause, you know, traffic accidents and issues, but it's a far different type of intoxication than alcohol or stimulants. And there is growing evidence. In the past, I've always said there, you know, the, so to speak, impairment window for marijuana was at least 24 hours. They're now saying that, you know, the degree of impairment you know, lasts in a profound way out to 36 hours or more. So there's growing evidence that that impairment window continues to increase. The problem here is the person no longer feels that they're high. They are no longer doing the comp compensatory activities they did when they felt, you know, high and intoxicated from THC. Yeah, you know, but the you know impairment per, you know persists in three critical activities. One is spatial discrimination. So how far away from me, you know, is that given object? They also have a hard time with multiple task tracking. So noticing things in their peripheral vision. They tend to be focused on the object in front of them. And, and the way I you know, reconcile that is they're concentrating so hard trying to find out how close to something they are, they don't notice anything in their peripheral vision. And then they also have problems you know, with quick decision making so and complex skills and tasks. So those things are hampered. 
So again, anybody who is driving, doing most manufacturing, doing involved in direct patient care, those are safety sensitive laborers that THC use the night before, the day before, profoundly impacts their safety of the work on that next day. CBD, I'm just going to touch on CBD, another naturally occurring cannabinoid. Uh, it, it's the cannabinoid that it has the anti-epileptic effect. There was just evidence released here recently that the, the pain relief effect in all likelihood is not due to CBD. There was a double-blind controlled study where people were given CBD and a placebo, and they both had the same degree of pain relief. So it did no better than placebo, meaning that, you know, there is a placebo effect whenever anybody takes a given pill, they all of a sudden say they feel better. Uh, again, so it is believed now that CBD isn't the pain mediator, that it may be a combination of, of THC and CBD and what the exact percentage should be to maximize that pain relief is still unknown. Uh, CBD is, uh, you know, FDA approved in a medication called Epidulex. It is a Schedule 5, DEA Schedule 5 drug. However, CBD is not a medication or a food product. You know, it is not, you know, unless it's Epidulex. And I, I believe, you know, reading what the FDA says verbatim is important here. The FDA is aware that some companies are marketing products containing cannabis and cannabis-derived compounds in ways that violate the Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetics Act that may put the health and safety of the consumers at risk. So the FDA itself is saying these CBD products aren't approved. They're not medications or food products. You know, THC from the cannabis plant remains federally illegal. And, you know, all of those over-counter CBD products, for the most part, aren't following any kind of, F, you know, any FDA. They're not approved by the FDA. There is no quality assurance process. Um those products can contain CBD. Some of them don't contain any CBD. It's really a buyer beware, um, you know, market. And again, CBD from a medical review perspective is not a medical explanation for a Delta 9 THC positive result. So medical marijuana in the workforce. You know, I'm not going to read this, every word on this slide. There's 38 states that have legalized it for medical use. 13 of those states, um, you know, have no law or case law that says you need to accommodate them in any way. That number continues to go down as the second number goes up. 19 states now say you really need to consider accommodation if you can. If you have a compelling business reason as to why you can't hire a medical you know, marijuana user, uh, based upon, you know, they're running the overhead crane in the ammunition plant and their, you know, use of that drug could have a catastrophic effect to that person, their coworkers, or the work environment, you know, you don't have to hire them for that job. Um, and then there's six states that remain silent. There's no regulation or case law. And just to call out Philadelphia, its own city state, you know, has banned pre-employment marijuana testing unless you meet um, criteria as a safety-sensitive employee under that statute. And within that statute, they have many classes of pe people that are safety-sensitive that you can continue testing THC in the pre-employment arena. Recreational marijuana continues to increase. My update at the end of last year, uh, you know, showed 19, that has increased to 22 plus Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. kind of legalized it in its own special way. Um, they basically allow people to self-certify for medical marijuana. You don't need to have a doctor. You can just say, I'm smoking marijuana because it's good for my health. And that is considered lawful use in, in Washington, D.C., as long as you're buying it at one of the approved uh, uh, so to speak, dispensaries. You know, so you have a bunch of states that have legalized it for recreational use. You have some states here, you know, most notably, you know, Jersey, Montana, Rhode Island, Washington, D.C., that have, you know, prohibitions of taking uh, employment action against uh, 
you know, so to speak, decriminalize uh, recreational users. And you have the state of New York that basically says you are unable to test for THC un- unless you have reasonable suspicion of drug use. And then the breaking news last year, you know, it's effective uh, uh, just under a year from now, you know, AB 2188, where, you know, California uh, has decided that the only way that you can test for THC um, for employment purposes outside of the federal program, such as DOT, is by testing a specimen that it tests for the evidence of psychoactive THC. Well, at this point in time, uh, that is really oral fluid or breath. Um, urine looks for the metabolite. Hair predominantly looks for the metabolite. So from that perspective, you know, as of you know, January 1st next year, if you want to continue testing for THC in California, no matter the test reason, pre-employment, random, post-accident, post-injury, uh, you know, reasonable suspicion, that test has to be with oral fluid. That is the only test that that so to speak captures that or is consistent with that that along with breath um so i shouldn't forget about breath in that arena but your urine program if you're testing for thc is no longer defensible um as well as your hair program now there are car car outs for employees in the building and construction trades and applicants or employees for federal jobs requiring clearance from the u.s department of defense also can uh, continue to test for THC metabolite. So there are some carve-outs, very limited, but from a broad perspective, oral fluid will be the California specimen, so to speak, going forward. So THC testing, it's the Todd Simo algorithm. And I really you know, present this to different clients as they're considering, do I keep it, do I remove it? So the first question you know, by policy that you should ask yourself is, Within that jurisdiction, is THC testing allowed? Uh, that's the first question. If it's not allowed, you should remove THC. So right now, there are you know two jurisdictions where it really isn't allowed, and I'll kind of go through those uh, coming up. And then the next question is, is, is the donor in a safety-sensitive position? As we saw on the, those other slides, you know, there's 19 states that have some sort of employment protection for medical users. There are some states that have a degree of employment protection for recreational users. However, if they're safety sensitive, you know, you can make a compelling business reason as to why you're testing for it and why you're making a derogatory hiring decision upon that. So I basically say if they're safety sensitive, depending upon your risk profile, and if you are more risk averse, you'll know, continue to have THC in the panel. However, you know, if they're non-safety sensitive, um, you can consider removing it. And I don't think you, you harm your program doing that. So the first algorithm, you know, consideration here, uh, you know, that's for urine and hair. Oral fluid's a little bit more straightforward. If you can't test for it, don't. If you can test, test score do. And the reason for that is, you know, Delta 9 THC only appears in oral fluid for about 16 hours. It is truly a marker of impairment. So it's not just a marker of exposure. It's a marker of impairment. If you're positive for oral fluid, you are impaired at the time of collection. It, and in all of the states uh, that don't not let you test for it, in all of the states, Impairment is a reason not to hire or terminate. You know, if you if you can say, hey, they were impaired at the time of collection, you have no burden to hire. So that's why I say if you want, you know, if you are risk averse, if oral fluid meets your needs, going through and doing oral fluid on everybody except the states where you can't, I think is a prudent thing. So, again, two places plus Philadelphia, as I talked about before, for most employees, you shouldn't have THC on the panel. Um, the one, New York, it's, it's a prohibition that is direct. You know, the state of New York has said, thou shall not test for THC unless you have reasonable suspicion. And that reasonable suspicion has to be, uh, you know, a contemporaneous articulable observations of impairment. That does not include smelling like marijuana. So in New York, smelling like marijuana isn't a reason to test someone for THC. New Jersey, 
substantially has the same rule. You can still test for THC, but you can't take employment action on it unless you believe the person was impaired or you have articulable contemporaneous observations of impairment. So therefore, doing a routine pre-employment test, I would say don't test for uh, THC. And the reason for that is if you can't take employment action against it, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, which means I always use the crane operator in the ammunition plant. So Bob, the crane operator in the ammunition plant, you know, uh, is positive for marijuana or is positive for THC. You are in New Jersey. You allow him to work as the crane operator. He blows up the plant. He kills three coworkers and himself doing so. Um, you're going to get three lawsuits from the families of those coworkers saying you allowed Bob to be in a crane in a safety sensitive position that could blow us up. And you knew he was a THC user. You shouldn't have done that. And OSHA says that you have to provide us a safe workforce. So you'll have three lawsuits that you will have to uh, defend yourself or, or settle. And then th there'll be a fourth lawsuit that comes in. And that's from Bob's family. Because Bob's family will say, you knew Bob was a marijuana smoker, and you allowed him to be in an unsafe position where he could kill himself. So therefore, we're suing you as well. So again, if you can't take action against it, it's just better not to test for it. Again, for people that are non-safety sense, you know, that are non-safety sensitive, I also look at Montana, Rhode Island, Washington, D.C., and Nevada in the pre-employment arena to not test for THC. Um, you know, those, those states have uh, those states in that city has the kind of most rigorous. Um, employment protections. Again, it's only for Nevada pre-employment. There is now case law that if you're a current employee using THC and have a positive drug screen, you you can a company can can terminate that person, can take derogatory employment action. Uh, so it's just in the pre-employment arena. But again, Montana, Rhode Island, Washington D.C. have fairly rigorous employment protections for recreational users. So THC panel trends. So I've kind of followed this. But, you know, the, my following this goes back to about 2014. Uh, you know, 2010, the first state, Arizona, uh, said that you need to provide employment protections to me medical users. When I go back to, like, 2018 and 2019, the number of clients that removed it from the panel was less than 1%. Um, you know, the pandemic, I really didn't look at that at all, but I kind of re-looked at it in the spring of 2021, and I was surprised to see that that number of less than 1% grew to just over 4% of the clients not having it. And those were generally 4% very high consumers, so you can see that they accounted for over 6% of the testing volume. Well, you can see as time marches forward, later in 2021, you know, Q3 2022, you know, end of, you know, end of 2022, that you can see the number of the amount of clients that have removed it has gone up to just over 10%. So, you know, one, one out of 10 of our clients has at least one panel that they do not do THC in. And that would make sense. New York's a big state. New Jersey's a, you know, a populous state. And therefore, both of them, you know, uh, removing THC from those panels makes sense. But the testing volume also, you know, when it was at 7% of clients, it went up to 11%. You can see that that number, so there's more clients not testing for it from end of 2021 to 2022. But the relative testing volume has kind of plateaued. It sits at about 12% of our specimens, uh, you know, don't have THC in them from a non-regulated perspective. So this teases out DOT numbers. Uh, because DOT has to test for it. But here's a concerning trend. Despite clients removing THC from their panel, the positive rate per quarter, MRO verified positive rate, so people who had a confirmed positive drug at the laboratory that did not have a reasonable verifiable medical explanation for the result, continues to go up. So, you know, this continues to ratchet up meaning that, you know, 12% of our specimens don't have THC in it, yet the positive rate is going up. You know, that's a concerning trend. That's showing that more and more people are using those different drugs, 
And, you know, my provocative statement here is, you know, based upon what I see with the trending of lab positives, MRO positives, that THC certainly is a gateway drug uh, for, for some people. You know, it's not a universal thing. Um, but for some people, you know, it is a gateway drug, just like alcohol is a gateway drug. So I'm not discounting that. But the more we introduce it into society, we can see that the more prevalent other substance abuse will be, again, in my opinion. So, again, despite a 12 percent of the specimens not testing for THC, the MRO verified rate continues to increase. And there's been a substantial decrease in alternate specimen use. So over 2022, it's, it's 39% decrease in hair utilization, 19% decrease in oral fluid utilization. And again, you can see the positive rate difference between uh, oral fluid specimen with THC being close to 8% or essentially 8% and without THC being 4.5%. US DOT update. I wish I had an update. I, I truly do. This is the same slide that I've presented since 2020. Um, you know, HHS still hasn't approved the lab. DOT did do a notice of propose, uh, proposed rulemaking. I have talked to the Office of Drug and Alcohol Program Compliance. They will adopt, you know, oral fluid as a specimen for DOT testing. They just want to have the first lab and manufacture the collection device being approved by the accreditation panel. Um, next is hair. So the Obama administration in his last term signed an act called the FAST Act, Fixing America's Surface Transportation. Within that act, uh, act it mandated um, Department of Human Health Services to create, you know, to allow, you know, create the rules around hair so it could be used by uh, DOT, by motor carriers and other DOT, uh, you know, DOT so to speak, regulated um, companies. Well, it took HHS a few extra years to get that out. And their initial rule that came out saying, yeah, you can use hair, but if it's positive, you have to do another specimen. That doesn't make sense from a scientific perspective, from a drug use perspective, from an industry perspective. So it wasn't well received. Um, there was a trucking, you know, the trucking employer group that did petition Congress to let them test for, for hair and be able to put those results into the clearinghouse uh, that FMCSA has as a repository of, of violations of drug, drug and alcohol tests, and, and that got shut, da uh, you know, shot down by FMCSA, you know, in January 2023, so just this month, and that was, you know, for insiders, that was what what was expected. Hair still has some challenges from how do you eliminate, you know, uh, so to speak, passive exposure, being in a you know, room with all kinds of people doing drugs for long, long periods of time, um, as well as the color bias. The darker the hair, the more drug, uh, so to speak, deposits in it. I think from a general occupation perspective, hair is a great specimen. But those things have to be resolved for the federal government to kind of move forward the way they need to. So return on investment. So, you know, the Obama administration actually did a quite, deal, uh, quite a bit of, of data mining for this. They came out and said that, you know, just lost productivity alone, uh, listed drug use and lost productivity cost employers $81 billion a year annually. Again, this is data now that, you know, it, or excuse me, it's beginning of its term, so 12 years old, 12 to 13 years old. So that number due to inflation is higher. Um, but then couple this with increased medical costs and both personal workman comp compensation, you know, uh, treatment. Uh, you know, so those factors, um, employee turnover, brand protection. So when you factor all of those together, it's around $193 billion a year that illicit drug use causes employers. If you take that number and divide it by the National Institute of Drug Addiction says there's anywhere from 10 to 14 people addicted to an illicit drug that are in the workforce or seeking employment. So some real easy math with a lot of zeros, you get a return on investment for every, you know, so to speak, derogatory drug screen result, a return on investment of $14,000 a year. So that's a big number. And when you look at that big number compared to non-regulated urine, 
oral fluid with THC, oral fluid without THC in hair, you can see that there's a big return on investment with each specimen. I mean, if you all of a sudden say, hey, I have to spend $40 to get $310, I'm going to take that bet every day. However, if you move to oral flu with THC, you're going to spend $32 and get over $1,000 back. That's a pretty, you know, pretty good decision if that meets your risk mitigation needs and how you need specimens collected. You can see that you remove you know, THC from it. It goes down, but it's still better than urine. And then hair, by far, has the highest, so to speak, uh, return on investment, but it also has the highest cost. So let's look at this of how much money you spend per $1 spent on your program. Urine still has a robust return on investment of $7.75. But you can, I'm not going to read the rest of the numbers here, but you see, you know, oral fluid outperforms the other uh, specimens, whether it's testing for THC or not, with testing for THC having the highest return on investment per dollar spent. So the five most important things to uh, consider for 2023. Number one is evaluating your policy. You should look at you know, where you have offices and what is the THC landscape in those given states or municipalities like Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. You should also look at your policy to say, what specimens am I allowed? You know, Todd Timo said these nice things about hair and oral fluid, and I really like that. Well, if you're in your Vermont and that's your job location, Vermont doesn't allow anything other than urine for substance abuse testing uh, or for, you know, controlled substances testing. So, again, look at, you know, what are allowed within your, in the use cases. You know, you also have to define how risk diverse are you. You know, hey, I need to remove THC because I need more more applicants, and I need these applicants, you know, to, so to speak, perform the job. You may need to take more risk than you have in the past. Again, that's a business decision, but you have to go into that business decision with eyes wide open. You know, you have to look at what's your candidate experience need to look like. Um, and then what rules outside of your company's drug-free workplace? So, again, if you are a – Department of Defense contractor, you may have some very strict rules that the DOD propagates to you on what you need to test for and and how you need to do it. So again, you need, as you're evaluating your policy, you got to take at least all of those things into consideration. I always said in, in nearly every presentation, I always say consider alternate specimens. They're less amenable to subversion. You get a better return on investment. Again, it really depends upon the factors in the, you know, your policy. But again, if you can deploy alternate specimens, you know, I believe that gives you your best bang for the buck in your drug-free workplace program. Reasonable suspicion programs are more important than ever. You know, with companies with the trend of eliminating THC from the pre-employment uh, test, you know, people may all of a sudden then start, you know, smoking their cannabis or using their cannabis the morning of job, driving into work. There's some studies that show it's, it's a huge number percentage of people that actually drive into work smoking marijuana. Um, so, again, there's, you know, there's some very concerning things there. So having a program in place, training your employees, hey, don't use drugs, don't do this, and then training your supervisors, managers, HR people to all of a sudden, you know, notice the articulable observations of drug use and be able to compel testing based upon that. You know, review your post-accident testing program because OSHA has softened on their stance saying, thou shalt not do any post-accident test unless you have reasonable suspicion. Well, now OSHA says, well, you could have a program as long as it's safety-based and you're doing it in the spirit of safety that you can test for substances outside of reasonable suspicion. And the last one here, it may be surprising to people, but it's create a CBD policy. I've uh, testified at, you know, a handful of CBD cases in 2022. Um, many of the questions that were asked were, well, what does the employee handbook say on CBD? 
Well, again, I don't control your employee handbook. You all do. But having statements in there that you review with your attorney saying, hey, we don't accept CBD as a reasonable medical explanation for a THC-positive result, having that on there may save you a great deal of heartburn when you're dealing with any kind of employment commission hearing. And then lastly, you know, the best practices recommendations really remain the same. you got to define your goals of your drug-free workplace program. You know, what's your safety profile? How risked are you? What's your view on applicant experience? What are those extra rules that your company may uh, be subject to? You know, create your policy around the specimen that you want to utilize, the panel that you want to test for, who's subject to testing, what trigger events mandate testing. So that's that reasonable cause post-accident. What is that trigger event that says, you did this, therefore you get a substance abuse test and an alcohol test. And then consequences if you say, I'm not doing that test. And then again, employee education is really important. You know, educate them on your policy, post your policy. There's some states that mandate for you to post your policy and have them sign it. So again, doing that as a best practice across the board, I think is a good thing. And then again, educate your management team on policy as well as signs and symptoms of impairment and have a good way that they can capture that. If you need to compel a four cause test, that they have a mechanism to do that and feel comfortable doing it. I know we're at time. I do do apologize running to time. Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, you went, you used up the whole time plus two minutes, but really good information, Dr. Seymour. I appreciate that. Um, we did get a lot of questions in the chat, specifically around marijuana too, lots of those. Um, but I think we can take those back and see which ones we can answer and then, and then reach out. Um, with answers to the individuals that asked. We do appreciate all your time. Thanks so much for joining. Again, you will receive a follow-up email with SHRM credit, um, and we would really appreciate it if you would finish our, or complete our survey here after today's presentation. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful rest of your day.